Hey, it's Mike here, and today, creatine, a highly suggested topic that I have put off for years that I'm finally doing because my ADD hyperfixation finally looped around to this topic, so we can look at a ton of research on it together. Is it a neurotransmitter like a recent study proposed? And of course, is it safe, which is something that has been a huge concern for me and others as well. And lightning fast, this video is sponsored by Thrive Market, and I just wanna let you guys know that they're offering 30% off your first order as well, as a free gift worth up to 60 bucks. Let's just get to it. All right, let's get to the basics. What is creatine? Well, it is a nitrogen-based organic compound, but it is not a protein like some other nitrogen-based organic compounds, and it plays a role in our energy metabolism. It recycles our ATP, which is you know our energy delivery. And it is not an essential nutrient, meaning that our body makes all that we need in order to be healthy, but we will explore the question, does taking exogenous creatine give you any above and beyond benefits? And I will say creatine supplementation is wildly common in the US regardless of diet. We're talking about 30% of collegiate athletes taking it. And in terms of strength sports, you know, up to 80% of people, even teen athletes are taking this stuff, which can lead to some side effects. Here to talk about those side effects is creatine wolf. Hey guys, on God, after I started taking creatine, now every full moon, I grow a ton of hair and claws. I did get bit by this really hairy guy, probably just a coincidence. Yeet. Creatine also helps you see in the dark and hear really well. It's so crazy. Thanks, Teen Wolf. I appreciate the report also from this study. Quote, Americans consume over 4 million kilograms a year of creatine with worldwide use, of course, much higher. This is proof that eating meat in your diet is not enough to be strong, which is why everybody feels like they need to take it. Talk about metabolism. Well, it is synthesized mainly by the liver. It is also somewhat synthesized in the kidney and the pancreas. And again, it has to do with energy metabolism in particular. For short bursts of energy, it is able to recycle that ATP and give you a little bit more of an edge. We'll talk about the studies on the exercise benefits in a bit, but it is also in our brain. So it is playing a role in energy delivery in our brain. And we have some really interesting memory studies, but just for people who are curious about how much is taken, there's generally a loading dose of 0.3 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, followed by a lower maintenance dose of 0.03 milligrams, one tenth of that. The lower dose will get you to the same place. It'll just take longer. As far as our body's distribution, 95% of our creatine is in our muscles. Just makes sense. It's trying to get that energy to move us. And so in animal muscle, there is creatine as well. Some people call that meat. So yeah, you can get it through eating various animal muscles. However, the amount is just dwarfed compared to supplementation, which is you know usually around five grams a day, depending on body weight. To break it down, a three ounce serving of beef has about 0.2 grams of creatine. So you would have to have like 25 servings of beef to get a standard supplement dose. It's also worth mentioning that cooking meat can turn creatine into carcinogenic heterocyclic amines. From this colon cancer, section of a food sciences book, quote, heterocyclic amines are the carcinogenic and mutagenic or DNA mutating chemicals formed from cooking muscle meats, such as beef, pork, fowl, and fish. And thankfully from this study, it doesn't appear that supplements expose you to those heterocyclic amines, again, because it's not cooked. But just to drive the point home, creatine in meat plays such a big role here that if you treat beef with an enzyme that breaks down creatine, you can reduce the DNA mutating effect of that meat by 70%. You now add the saturated fat, the cholesterol, the oxidized heme iron, NEU5GC, inflammation, blah, blah, blah. It makes sense if you're trying to get creatine, you get more anyway from supplementing. And all this brings me to the topic of safety, which I wanna hammer out really quickly because I was really concerned about creatine, you know, especially growing up, we didn't know as much about it. I had a friend who was into bodybuilding in high school and he was scooping creatine and I was looking at him like he was like self-harming to make those gains. The biggest concern that I remember hearing about was kidney stress because your kidneys have to like filter out the excess creatine. But there are studies that you know followed people for years supplementing and found that they're well tolerated in healthy individuals. And yeah, that's up to 30 grams a day, which is a lot long term. You know, most people are gonna be taking about five grams long term. It's also worth mentioning that your muscles get saturated with creatine, so it's 
really not worth going over a certain threshold anyway. You're just gonna be wasting it. But I do have to mention that there are people who shouldn't be taking creatine partially for these reasons from Mount Sinai, quote, people with kidney disease, high blood pressure, or liver disease should not take creatine. Creatine. And while the strength stuff is really interesting, what has sparked my interest in creatine a lot is just its potential as something that can help treat other disorders. And here's the Cleveland Clinic's list of disorders and diseases that could benefit from creatine. I mean, this is quite a long list of some serious disorders. There's also hope that it could help with seizures because they are an energy issue as well as traumatic brain injury recovery. And perhaps most interestingly, a recent study found that it could potentially help with long COVID recovery. This randomized control trial gave people either four grams of creatine a day or a placebo, and the results were quite good at three months. They had significant reduction in general fatigue, and at six months, better scores on a lot of things such as breathing difficulty and headaches. And while the trial only had like six people in either group, there were some statistically significant and powerful results. You know, things that faded anyway faded way more rapidly rapidly in the creatine group, like the headaches, which is nuts how fast they went away, and benefits were, quote, possibly due to its energy replenishing and neuroprotective activity. And now for a quick break with our sponsor, Thrive Market, who I did get a nice, big, beautiful box from, which I'm a crack open. I'd like to thank Sierra for packaging this. And Thrive is a online membership-based marketplace that you can buy things from food to cosmetics on. And I like it because you can just type in vegan and boom, you get 60 plus pages of fully vegan results. No wandering through the grocery aisles, flipping everything over. And that's really convenient for people who are just trying to go vegan and you get to try stuff that's not in your area, as I always say. <sighs> I think this box is taking creatine. All right, let's see what we got. Got a bunch of interesting stuff I hadn't tried before, like pesto paste that is vegan, some artichoke spread, various snacks, wild blueberry fruit spread. And it has been a while since I tried Ripple, so I'm gonna try that again. And they calculated that on my $60 order, I saved 16 bucks this time, even more than last time. And I did have to check, and yeah, they even sell creatine, which is by a vegan brand and quite reasonably priced. And I'm not trying to like sell creatine in this video, I just wanted to mention that. And orders over $49 ship for free using carbon neutral shipping methods from their zero waste warehouses, which is another reason I love working with Thrive. And in case you're wondering, their memberships are either a monthly membership for $12 a month or an annual membership for $59.95 a year, which saves a lot. And if you wanna check it out, you can go to thrivemarket.com slash Mike the Vegan for 30% off your first order as well as that free gift worth up to 60 bucks. All right. And so let's just move right on to the brain and talk about, you know, are vegans worse off? Is this actually a neurotransmitter? But first, yes, 5% of our creatine is in the brain. Basically all the creatine that isn't in our muscles is in our brains. And again, it plays a role in energy metabolism, recycling ATP and more in the brain. And some of the brain benefits are not insanely dramatic, but undeniable in terms of the quality of evidence from this meta-analysis of 23 randomized control trials. Quote, overall creatine supplementation improved measures of memory compared with placebo. Though it is clear that quite a good portion of the studies found no change, and this change, looking at the forest plots, is quite age dependent. Younger adults and children not gonna see a result, but older adults on average have quite a positive result. We also have randomized control trials like this one showing less mental fatigue, and we see less mental fatigue in sleep deprivation as well, which is pretty impressive. Because of studies like this, people have put creatine into the like no tropics or cognitive boosting category. And that sparks the question, do vegetarians and vegans who really aren't getting it in diet have a disadvantage? So we have to ask, are meatless diet brains lacking in creatine? Thankfully, we have several studies on this. This Brazilian study looked at brain creatine levels of vegetarians and meat eaters and found that vegetarians weren't lower. And despite their creatine intake being functionally zero in the vegetarian group, they actually trended slightly higher brain creatine, slightly higher, like 1.3% higher, but I just had to mention that. They conclude that dietary creatine intake seemed not to influence brain creatine content in healthy adults, suggesting that in normal conditions, brain is dependent on its own creatine synthesis. And I guess this makes sense, only 
85% of our body's creatine is in our brain, so we're not having to create some super huge amount. So of course, people who don't get it from their diet are gonna have adequate amounts. Studies have also reported memory improvements that are specific to vegetarians, which have people going, oh my God, is there some deficit to not eating meat in terms of the brain? Well, that's not what the studies actually show, looking to this one. Despite the meat and non-meat creatine groups being you know, statistically equivalent in the beginning during the first memory test where they were asked to recall words, quote, the major finding was that after supplementation, the memory of vegetarians was better than that of meat eaters. This is kind of mysterious and this chart is a little confusing if you look at it, but once you get to know it, you can see that Generally, the groups were doing worse in the second test, and the researchers say, you know, they might have accidentally had harder words, but the vegetarian group still did really well in that second memory test. And guys, my shirt randomly popped open during the video at some point. I didn't see it on my tiny camera screen. I'm sorry, just ignore it. <laughs> Why did this happen? We have to ask, was it raising brain levels of creatine in these vegetarians? Well, looking to this other study from Brazil, which looked at brain creatine levels after supplementation in vegetarian and meat eater groups. However, they didn't find an increase in either group. However, However, other studies like this one, which was just solely on meat eaters who would get some creatine in their diet, found somewhere between a three and 13% increase in brain creatine with supplementation. So we don't know if there was a boost or not, but the research back in that original study say that it could have had to do with an indirect effect just on glucose metabolism. You know, they say memory has a high energy demand, so anything you can do to free up more energy could help. Anyway, none of this scientific literature hints at people who don't eat meat having worse brain health from a lack of creatine. If anything, there's just a weird benefit from taking it. But let's move on to that question. Is creatine a new neurotransmitter? And of course, other neurotransmitters include dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, etc. Well, I was able to find some hints of talking about creatine as a neurotransmitter in some you know decades old research. This very recent early October preprint article has gotten some news because they are proposing that it is a neurotransmitter citing things like how it's present in synaptic vesicles and it gets released upon stimulation and has effects on cortical neurons. And in response, people have said that, yeah, this largely meets the textbook criteria for a neurotransmitter. So the question becomes, does it have a mood effect like serotonin could? Well, looking around, the closest I found to an answer was this randomized control trial, which paired creatine and SSRIs, which of course are serotonin reuptake inhibitors that help with depression. They found that by the end of the study, half of the women in the creatine plus SSRI group no longer had depression, which was twice as good of a result as just the SSRI group alone. Now that is really dramatic. The study isn't tiny, but it could have been larger. So I'd love to see that replicated. It's unlikely though that there's a direct mood effect of creatine. However, it could just be helping to support brain chemistry generally. It has a fluid holding attribute. So it's called an osmolite, which could help. It also might help balance calcium, etc. But speaking of fluid retention, let's get onto the topic of muscles and eventually hit that question. Is it all just water retention for those gains? Now, the research on creatine and muscles is pretty consistent across the board that it either has a benefit or at worst, no effect. Looking to this review of 16 randomized control trials, quote, overall creatine is an efficient form of supplementation for muscle growth in the healthy young population with adequate training in a variety of dosage strategies and athletic activities. The studies that fail to have a benefit are in older people, and some of them might be too short. However, even a six day study did find an increase in maximal strength. And this again is that situation where creatine allows for the recycling of ATP, so it gives you more energy and can allow people to simply train more. They might be able to get some more reps in or go further toward failure, which could stimulate muscle growth more. But the results aren't gonna be insane. Somebody who supplements creatine might only see a 20% increase in muscle creatine, which is not steroids. <laughs> And that brings us again to the question of, do people who don't eat meat like vegetarians and vegans suffer in this arena? Well, vegetarians do have about 16% lower muscle creatine levels than people that eat meat. Is it destroying their gains? Well, first of all, vegetarians who supplement are quickly gonna get 
way over where your meat eater who doesn't supplement is because of the higher level. And this is another situation, this weird one where vegetarians, despite not doing worse, at baseline, get a weird benefit. This study looked at meat versus vegetarian people, supplementation versus placebo. And again, despite starting in roughly the same place for those vegetarians who were given creatine, compared to the meat eaters given creatine, they kicked butt in terms of their total power as measured through knee flexion and extension. Yeah, the vegetarian creatine group crushed it and beat the meat group. And vegans are also a group who wouldn't be getting dietary creatine. And so we have to ask, do they show up as being weaker? Well, looking to this study, they matched vegans and meat eaters in terms of like their body composition, et cetera. And no, the vegans were just as strong and get this, their VO2 max was better. It might be a cardiovascular health thing, but either way, in terms of energy metabolism, uh, that's better. So this is interesting, you know, we have different factors for different diets here. Maybe the lower inflammation that we see on vegan diets helps, and then maybe the better cardiovascular health helps. And then if you just add the creatine, it's like boom over the top. Now let's talk about that water weight issue. And I did believe this, that, oh, people who are taking creatine are probably just gaining water weight and, you know, the gains might not be real. That's what I was told at least. And yes, creatine is osmotically active, which means it can attract more water essentially into those cells. However, it appears that this is a short-term effect in terms of overall you know, cell water content. The original shorter frame studies that were like less than a week long did show that inner cell water volume did go up. However, when we're looking to all of the newer studies weeks out over and over and over again, it shows that there's no increase in cell water volume. And even though there is an increase in total water volume in the body, it is proportionate to the muscle gained, which is key. And this is where I wanna add on to the topic of IGF-1, because I did see in one of the studies, it was like, oh my God, the creatine group increased their IGF-1. And I was like, oh my gosh, I talk about all the time how this is associated with an increased risk of cancer, but we got to look at some nuance here. Well, yeah, as this Oxford article mentions, massive studies show a good correlation with blood IGF-1 levels and cancer, but we're not talking about blood IGF-1 levels here. And I have to mention that just lifting weights is going to be increasing your muscle levels of IGF-1, yet strength training is associated with lower cancer rates generally. And this might just have to do with, you know, trying to increase cell turnover in a muscle has less of a risk of turning into cancer than an organ that already has really rapid cell turnover, like, you know, reproductive organs, which are at a higher risk of cancer. However, looking to just like general muscle cancer, since we grow our muscles so slowly, uh, yeah, they're considered super rare. Yeah, quote, soft tissue sarcoma is a rare type of cancer. And in the end, it probably is the case that the increased level of muscle IGF-1 is just a result of being able to work out more, the same reason that you're getting those gains. So it would just be equivalent to somebody working out a little bit more and again, strength training associated with lower cancer. In the end, creatine is super interesting. We looked at so many studies and I just feel like there are still so many studies that I would like to explore and talk about, but you know, only got so much time. But it is the case that yeah, it's not essential Without eating meat, the body still makes enough, and that is clear from you know these brain levels, these uh, strength results in vegans. But it looks like in terms of brain and muscle, you can get an added above and beyond what meat eaters have benefit from supplementing with creatine. Now again, by getting it from a source that is not meat, you're dodging those mutagenic heterocyclic amines as well as that animal saturated fat, cholesterol, heme iron, etc. And then we also have those other brain benefits in terms of memory, especially in older people, and when people are fatigued through a lack of sleep, and just all of those diseases and disorders that creatine could potentially help with that we need more studies on are super compelling to me. So what do you think, creatine wolf? Yeah, I'm not gonna stop taking creatine anytime soon, like no cap. I mean, seriously, I can't fit my cap on my head because I have too much hair now, but it's worth it. And finally, you can click the link below if you would like to try out Thrive Market, get that 30% off your first order and that gift that's worth up to 60 bucks. All right, let me know down below if there's any interesting stuff about creatine I didn't miss, any concerns that I did not address. And of course, feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.